Well, thanks very much. I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I thought the best I could do today would be to begin with uh, setting out the genesis of the white paper on Australia in the Asian century. Uh, the historical context of it was that in the early 1980s, upon the election of the Hawke government, uh, that government, led by Prime Minister Bob Hawke, appreciated that we were not uh, a competitive economy, uh, that we needed to do much better and that there were fantastic opportunities from us engaging, or as Bob called it, enmeshing our economy with that of the region. Uh, in order for us to pursue diplomatically the opportunities that were available, we needed to boost our competitiveness and to cut what you know is a fairly long story short, Hawke and Keating and their ministers set about refashioning the Australian economy from one that was inward looking, protected by higher tar tariff barriers where we were uh, pretty much selling manufactured goods to ourselves to one that was open to the world. Now, the people here in this room represent that part of the economy that already was open to the world, but it was burdened by uh, higher than necessary input costs because of the protection that was available in very large amounts to manufacturing. So Hawke and Keating began the task of liberalising the financial markets, of uh, liberalising product markets by reducing those trade barriers over time and therefore easing the burden on our export industries. Of course, one of the first steps of the Hawke government was to float the dollar. Uh, and about that, I'll have more to say in a little while. So uh, to cut a long story short again, that uh, reform did work. It lifted our national productivity uh, to very high rates of growth. Uh, and at the same time, the diplomacy involving the Prime Minister Hawke and leaders especially from China and India was such that uh, Hawke and uh, his ministers foresaw what has now come to be known as the Asian century. Through the discussions that Bob had with Deng Xiaoping and other leaders in China, he realised that China would be opening up uh, and so it did. And by that process of opening up, it has liberated literally hundreds of millions of people from poverty and created purchasing power that previously was not uh, able to be contemplated. So uh, reflecting upon this, as uh, former trade advisor and economic advisor to Bob, I began discussing with the Prime Minister the idea of a white paper on Australia in the Asian century to bring about what I prefer to call the second great economic transformation. The first one being the creation of the open competitive economy and the second one being those policy changes that are needed to take full advantage of uh, the Asian century. And that's really what the white paper does. It sets out uh, 25 policy objectives and pathways for achieving those and very soon we'll be releasing formally an implementation plan, but we haven't let the grass grow under our feet since the release of that white paper in October. We've refocused the work of, the, uh, of Austrade towards the region, the Export Market Development Grant Scheme towards the region, the work of the Export Finance and Insur Insurance Corporation towards the region. Peter Garrett has uh, announced that um, Mandarin will be the first uh, priority language to be incorporated through the processes of the national curriculum. We are financially assisting young Australians to study in Asia and that legislation has been introduced into the Parliament. We've completed a free trade agreement between Australia and Malaysia and there are other measures that have been adopted too. But this second transformation itself seeks to mirror a transformation that's occurring in Asia itself. China in particular adopted a model of export growth uh, and so its investment strategy was very much directed towards manufactured exports. But 
Uh, through its 12 five-year plan, China has consciously decided to re-engineer its growth model to be more inclusive of its population in general, to spread the benefits of growth from the coastal areas into uh, Western China, which itself will uh, impart greater political stability and make everyone feel part of the growth model. So the idea here is to lift consumption uh, and perhaps uh, de-emphasize investment in export-oriented manufacturing. Now, uh, we need to adapt to that. It's not a threat, it's a fantastic opportunity for Australia as we then seek to transform our economy again. What we need to do is to acknowledge the probability that given the very large amounts of foreign investment that continue to come into this country, both in the short-term and long-term foreign investment, that the Australian dollar is likely to remain elevated for some considerable time, indeed for the foreseeable future. Everyone knows that that, while reducing the cost of imported inputs into business processes here in Australia, is a burden on our export industries. So where do we go in terms of uh, transforming our economy in order to take advantage of the Asian century? It became evident in the preparation of the white paper on Australia in the Asian century that what, happen what is happening in China is also happening to a greater or lesser extent in other major economies in the region to such an extent that uh, it is expected by 2030 there will be three billion middle-class consumers in our own region. And I guess without uh, being, uh, this being a matter of um, uh, conscious uh, uh, decision. We've had a view that Asia is, as a whole is a poor region. Uh, I think we should be dispensing with that view pretty quickly because uh, our own region will be where the action is, where the three billion middle class consumers are and therefore where the opportunity is for Australia. It means for agricultural production that we have a once in a generation opportunity to have market-driven regional development in Australia. I think everyone lauded the idea that Gough Whitlam had 40 years ago of uh, uh, growth centres, but that was really an attempt by governments to create growth centres. Here's an opportunity for the market to create growth centres in our regional cities and towns. We know that many of our regional cities are actually doing reasonably well. Many country towns are still struggling. But we have an opportunity here to provide the high quality produce that is going to be increasingly demanded by the middle classes of Asia. When we think of what they are demanding and what we have, you can see a perfect mix here. Because Australia, along with New Zealand, have developed a reputation, hard won, as a clean, green producer of premium agricultural products. And it is exactly those agricultural products either in raw form or in processed form that are in increasing demand in the region. And I'll give you just some short-term evidence of that. In terms of uh, market access, I think we're going to see increasingly countries themselves unilaterally opening up their markets to Australia because their people are demanding these products and all of the trade barriers and quantitative tariffs and quantitative restrictions are doing is either restricting supply or increasing the price for their own population. So just in the last few months, uh, we have had some very significant breakthroughs. Russia has now resumed the importation of kangaroo meat into Vladivostok from one of the two processes, macro meats, in South Australia, and we're working with the Russian authorities to achieve the same outcome for the kangaroo meat processing facility uh, west of Brisbane. So that has just happened, that shipment, those shipments have now resumed. We have achieved market access, quota free, to India for Australian processed lamb. 
Now, the five-star restaurants in India are demanding this product. It's small quantities at this stage, but it can now enter free of quota. Uh, very recently, China received its first shipment of Tasmanian cherries after signing a new export protocol. Only a little while ago, this year, China lowered its tariff on retail infant formula from 20% uh, to 5% because the middle classes of China are demanding that infant formula. Uh, and so these are the sorts of breakthroughs that are occurring. Indeed, the Philippines has now uh, relaxed its restrictions on horticultural exports from Australia to the Philippines. It's got to the point where right now, uh, dairy producers are producing milk to put into fresh milk containers, into refrigerated 747s, and they are being flown directly into China. So if you want a kind of window as to what can be achieved, I hope that I've provided it. We need to go down this path of very high value premium produce in order to overcome the very hurdle that we've been uh, talking about, and that is the likelihood of an ongoing high dollar. This means for Australian agricultural produce, of course, our traditional exports will still be in demand, wheat and wool and so on. Indeed, it could be argued that we're already an agricultural superpower. We're the uh, world's largest wool exporter, second largest beef exporter, fourth largest wheat exporter. Uh, so we're already uh, well established in those sorts of products, but I do urge everyone to think of those clean, green, premium products that command a price which is easily able to jump the hurdle created by the high Australian dollar. And if we look at some of the places that are producing these sorts of products, Tasmania is a classic. Everyone thinks of Tasmania as a producer of clean, green, premium products, like the rest of Australia, disease-free, uh, and people know that if it comes from Tasmania, then it's got a good reputation. King Island for cheese production. Tasmanian, uh, everyone's got their own view about the best Tasmanian uh, champagne, uh, the best champagne in Tasmania, if we're allowed to call it champagne, but certainly the Tasmanians would think their Jantz uh, champagne is up there with the best. But it's not just Tasmania, it's all those parts of Australia that are capable of capitalising on our hard-won reputation for those clean green products that um, are disease free and on which that premium can be uh, commanded. So just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister and uh, our Innovation Industry Minister, Greg Combe, announced the establishment of innovation precincts in Australia and they named two of them. And they are, that includes a food processing precinct uh, in Eastern Melbourne. I, I, am, I don't think that it's, um, likely that we could ever have been as optimistic about the future of our premium agricultural produce as we are today, as we should be today. But it will require a marketing effort, it will require a promotion effort. I can say to you though, the market is there. We just need to work collaboratively through our institutions such as Austrade, uh, through our embassies in the various countries and our consulates and our Austrade offices because this is a once in a generation opportunity where we truly can see that we can be a food superpower in these premium products. The final thing I want to say before asking questions is this. To imagine that this can be achieved without foreign investment is stupid is absolutely stupid. And we cannot have unchallenged the debate going on in Australia that there should be uh, a, a stop sign put up to Chinese investment in Australian agricultural uh, production. Of course, any such Chinese investment needs to pass a national interest test. But we've heard from the coalition signals that Chinese investment in agriculture and in food processing is unwelcome. We've heard that from Senator Barnaby Joyce. We've heard that, that particular forms of state-owned enterprise investment in Australia uh, from the mouth of the opposition leader would be unwelcome and unlikely to be approved. 
we're told that our superannuation funds will finance all of the necessary investment. Now, the only reason those superannuation funds have $1.4 trillion under management is previous Labor government's compulsory superannuation. And I find it ironic that now we've got the opponents and ongoing opponents of compulsory superannuation saying they've got a great idea, access those superannuation funds. Of course, Australian superannuation funds will see opportunities here and they should make those decisions on commercial grounds. And the more, the better, as far as we're concerned. But we will not be able to do the right thing by Australian farmers. We will not be able to do the right thing by the working men and women of this country the people who are employed in food processing uh, if we say that foreign investment is not welcome or that somehow it is uh, badly inferior to any alternative. I think it's important that we have a robust debate about this, but Chinese investment is just the next generation that followed British investment, American investment, Japanese investment, investment from other parts of the region. China is interested in making these investments. Any investment must pass a national interest test, but it would be a betrayal of Australia's national interest if any uh, political party sought to put up the shutters to foreign investment in Australian agriculture and the great opportunities that that provides for our farmers, for our small towns, for our regional centres, for the working men and women of Australia and for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, um, for that very optimistic a address. Um, some of the background to the Asian Century Policy and we look forward to the implementation plan. Um, which uh, you'll be releasing shortly. Uh, the Minister is available to take some questions um, on, a, on a tight time frame, but uh, I think we've probably got about sort of five or six minutes and, and Minister already some there. Um, perhaps if you could just say who you are and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and where you're from. Mick, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Mick Keogh, Australian Farm Institute. Thanks for that address, Minister, and thanks for being so positive. I guess there's two issues that merge out of it. One is the focus on Australia as a premium supplier. Yep. Um, when, when we drill down, of course, we supply a lot of bulk commodities. There's certainly premium products, but we supply a lot of bulk commodities. And I guess burdened as we are with first world sensibilities and cost, um, supplying those in a, in a competitive market like Asia is a real challenge unless we can actually put a package, a, a promotion around those products to, to, to convince buyers to, to buy them. And, and uh, I, I think there's a real interesting question there about how we do that, because I don't think um, that particular aspect has been thought through enough. And you mentioned promotion. I'd be interested in your views on that. The second is, uh, it seems that as we knock down trade barriers, um, what springs up even more quickly than, uh, than, uh, than a lawn is uh, technical barriers to trade. And uh, do you think there's enough energy going in from the Australian government into tackling those uh, and getting them out of the road as well? Yeah. Well, thanks. And, and it's true that uh, even for our bulk commodities, uh, we have a reputation for being at the upper end of the supply, the quality of bulk commodities. It also assists. I mean, if we were producing, you know, by international standards, low-grade wheat, not hard wheat, then that would be even more difficult. If we were producing crappy wool instead of premium wool, that would be more difficult for us. You know, if we were producing wool just to produce um, uh, very tough carpets, um, factory grade carpets, we probably wouldn't be making the sort of money that we can on premium quality wool. So I think notwithstanding that it is a bulk commodity, overall we retain that reputation as, as a premium supplier. And, and as you glean, what I'm saying is there are other commodities with smaller production runs that are not bulk commodities on which we can make a lot of money, including our wines in particular. Whenever I go to China, they're talking about how they can get their hands 
wines on our red wines, that seem like red wines, um, but really expensive red wines. Um, in terms of market access, I agree with you that there are uh, lots of technical barriers. Uh, we're accused of the same, by the way, uh, so they think that Australia uh, has those. The truth is we don't use our quarantine services and buy our security uh, Australia as an artificial trade barrier, but we do it in order to maintain that reputation as a clean green producer. Because if we get pests in Australia, if we get some of the diseases that result in other markets being closed, such as uh, BSE or foot and mouth disease, then the game's over. And so we uh, are very clear that we do that, but not as an artificial trade barrier. The, the list of uh, breakthroughs, if you like, that I gave you actually includes tearing down some of those technical barriers to trade. And we do it. It's a quiet diplomacy, uh, to be very frank with you, because if we stand on the rooftop, rooftops and complain, it doesn't seem to get very far. A lot of the decisions about technical barriers to trade are not made in their, the equivalent of their cabinets or by the leaders of those countries, but very much at a operational level, and we engage with them all the time. Uh, as I say, we don't put it in the papers because all that can do is set us back. Uh, but a number of those market access breakthroughs, including the Russian uh, kangaroo meats to Russia, were very much about that quiet diplomacy. I do it at my level, and then we follow up at the technical level. There's a lot more to do, because there's a lot more of them, and we won't relent. Minister, I know you're used to taking... I'm right for another, another couple five minutes. minutes. Yep. All right. I know you're used to taking questions from the media. I think our next question is from Colin Bettles, who's the national reporter for Rural Press here in Canberra. Yep. Uh, Minister Emerson, there's been a bit of talk recently about the Korean FTAs and overcoming them. Um, industry are sending a delegation up there in the next week or so to try and work through there. Can you just give us an explanation from the government's point of view, because that's obviously a critical beef market and yeah. people are starting to get worried that this trade differential now, which is yeah. uh, working in our advantage, the clean green reputation we have for products is keeping us in the market, but if it keeps going on, it opens the door to the US and some of these other bigger competitors. Sure. Okay, um, the career FTA is well advanced, but it is true there is a difficulty. Uh, the new president has been inaugurated now. The new trade minister will be sworn in soon, and as soon as that happens, we will resume the negotiations. There are two issues. Uh, the beef tariff, that is the reduction in the beef tariff over time. Uh, the US got a reduction over 15 years. Korea has offered, offered us a reduction over 18 years. After several years, the gap between the US tariff and the Australian tariff under, under what we've been offered becomes quite wide and commercially very, very significant. So when I relayed that offer to the industry, the industry's urging to me was to reject it. And we told um, the previous government that we needed to improve on that offer. They can't improve on that offer until the new trade minister and the, and the apparatus is set up. Uh, there is another issue called investor state dispute settlement, uh, and it's the policy of this government not to have investor state dispute settlement provisions in agreements whereby a, a foreign corporation can take uh, the Australian government in this case to an inter international jurisdiction uh, under a trade deal. Now, in order to give uh, the farming community a, a, a tangible uh, assessment or an understanding of what this could involve, in uh, the US-Canada-NAFTA agreement right now, um, or recently, a, a gas producer has taken the Canadian government to ISDS, to an international dispute settlement, uh, because it wants to regulate the terms and conditions under which shale gas can be developed. So I think most Australian rural producers would like uh, the idea that a state or federal government can regulate um, the conditions under which uh, coal seam gas can be developed in farming lands. Now, I'm not saying that that therefore translates directly to the Australia-Korea FTA, but it does mean that there are interests 
on the part of the Australian rural sector in the issue of investor state dispute settlement and whether that would constrain an Australian government's ability to regulate in respect of whether it be coal seam gas or water entitlements and so on without entering uh, or ending up in an international dispute over which the Australian government could be told to reverse that decision or pay very large amounts of compensation. You, are you expecting a conclusion to the FTA soon though? I've been seeking conclusion to the FDA since I was trade minister, uh, appointed trade minister. Of course we're seeking a conclusion. There's just those two issues left uh, and we will do everything we possibly can to bring it to a conclusion. But our position as stated in the um, trade policy statement of April 2011 is that we don't include investor state dispute settlement provisions.